Hello, everyone. This is Paul Erickson with Management One, and I am so pleased to be a part of the Celeron virtual conference in 2021. Today, I'm going to be talking about Zen and the art of retail recovery, how to achieve post-pandemic success. Now, I think if we've learned anything from previous recessions, and certainly this last year has been a year like no other, previous recessions have always exposed existing weaknesses and accelerated trends. And even before COVID, there were a lot of retailers that faced challenges around like increasing debt, moderate growth at best, uh, slowing asset turnover, particularly in inventory. And I don't think anybody can overstate the damage done when your stores were closed for weeks or months at a time last spring, because each of your regular customers represents a relationship that took you years to develop and nurture, and losing that continuity is a risk to any retailer's position in the marketplace. What took years and even decades to build in two or three months was severely damaged, if not destroyed, in a very short period of time. Now, most retailers were forced into put into place austerity measures to survive the last 12 months. We slowed investments in innovation. We cut back on inventory. We focused on just getting through the year. And we were really less focused on what comes next? What's post-pandemic retail look like? And also, I have to say that many retailers that I talk to, I feel are sort of experiencing a low-grade PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. That's a mental health disorder for someone that has experienced some trauma. That's usually talked about when, people, when our soldiers come back from Iraq or Afghanistan. But I don't think it's an overstatement that for more than a few retailers, the last year has been traumatic. And to the point, a post-pandemic retail environment can actually be different to be difficult to envision after going through what we went through. But we are facing an unprecedented opportunity right now in retail. There's every reason to believe the economy is going to become becoming roaring back. And I say that based on the vaccine rollout, which is doing very, very well. We've had new rounds of consumer stimulus checks that have gone out. And we actually are seeing this happen pretty dramatically right now as I speak. We all know the savings rate has doubled over the past 12 months. We are, the, the consumer, your customer, is sitting on an ocean of cash. And fall 2020, actually, retail business posted relatively strong results of, based on pent-up demand, which pushed your consumers back into the stores. You know, I'll give you an example. December was actually a really good December, which I think the media, which tends to downplay everything and make everything sound worse than it is, December retail sales rose 6.7%. That was based on, on expenses that they normally would have spent on travel was funneled into gifting instead. So the question really is, are we gonna be prepared for life after the pandemic? Will we be ready? What can we do to anticipate? What can we do to plan for? Or even can we plan for it? You know, at Management One, we have proven that retail business, and we do this every day, is actually something that can be predicted, that can be planned for, can be anticipated, can be forecasted, even during a pandemic, with surprising precision. We actually, what we did is we went back and looked at eight months, July 2020 through February 2021, 2021 just to see how accurate we were at forecasting our clients' sales at a time when many people told us you can't forecast, it's simply too much of an unknown. And the results even surprised the management team at the company. We projected for those eight months for our client base, $783 million in sales. And when we looked at what the, our clients actually did, it was 786 million. The difference was less than one third of 1% off. So predicting sales during a pandemic is impossible? Wrong. Why is this important? It's important because if you can accurately project sales revenue in the future, you can be better prepared for staffing the stores and for inventory positions in the store. Now, there is a, a high degree of likelihood 
that this fall is going to exceed everyone's expectations. And now is the time to start making smart business decisions to maximize your selling opportunities that are right around the corner. Now, I told my daughter that I was going to be giving a presentation to my, our friends at Celerant on Zen and the art of retail recovery. And the question she asked me is probably the question you're all asking yourself right now. What the heck is Zen? Well, what is the meaning of Zen, actually? Um, at one level, I think the meaning of Zen is really easy. Zen is actually meditation. But on another, much deeper level, I think the answer becomes more personal because Zen is actually on a deeper level about purpose or goals so that we can achieve what the Japanese call Kaizen. We can achieve continuous improvement that can make a difference in your life and in your business. And the truth is that lessons from ancient to not even so ancient philosophers are still pretty relevant today because they have Zen as well. They deal with human nature and human nature can and should be applied to achieving retail success. So let's start with one of my favorite philosophers. You know, one of the things that I threatened my dad many years ago when I went to college is I said, dad, I'm thinking about majoring in philosophy. And we, after he came through, after he fainted, I said, I'm just kidding, I wanna be a marketing major. But Socrates said, the secret of change is to focus all your energy, not fighting the old, but building the new. You know, there's still a primacy to brick and mortar that can't be entirely replaced on a website. Since stores, brick and mortar stores, evoke experiences and sensations that a website can't. And certain products benefit from a venue where they can be handled physically, not just be looked at online. And your store must evolve if it expects to engage more meaningfully with customers. Becoming an experience hub rather than simply a point of sale. Focus your energy on not fighting the old, but building the new. Shoppers tend to spend more in stores than they do online. And brick and mortar locations are more likely to catalyze spontaneous purchases, impulse items, than online. In-store customers are exposed to an array of merchandise that if it were online could be quite a chore to slog through. Look, for the last 12 to 14 months, we've all been stuck at home, and today we crave human interaction. And in our business, that can only be found shopping in stores. Because shopping in stores and brick-and-mortar retail is shopping is social. Buying is online, and that's simply buying. Your sales floor has to become really a selling floor where your customer comes to dream and play and select what they like and what they want. And we need to learn from the very best players out there in retail on what changes need to take place on your sales floor to really make a difference for your customers and for your revenue. Because with so many choices out there, unless you have something unique and special to offer your customers that goes beyond what you've always thought, including that having the lowest price and the highest assortment is not only deadly for your business, but irrelevant to the customer. So I wanna talk about a few stores that I think fit this model and, and really what, when they opened uh, and thought changed, they, they were not thinking the old, but they were building the new. The first one is Zara. Those of you who heard me speak have heard me speak about Zara a lot. And the reason why I talk about Zara is that they are, I think without question, the most successful boutique chain on the history of planet Earth. They're a Spanish company. They have 6,000 locations around the globe. And the first time I ever went into a Zara, I couldn't understand really why they were as successful as they were. What makes them different than other good boutiques? The merchandise looked great, displayed very, very well. The sales force were, sales associates on the floor were very knowledgeable and friendly. It was a very good store, but what? why was Zara so successful and left other of their competitors behind? Well, I think they 
tapped into something that's important in fashion if you're in the fashion business. And that is, is that nothing stays on the Zara floor for more than six weeks. After six weeks, I don't know what they do with it, but it's gone, never to be seen again. Rotation, how fast do you turn your inventory? And it doesn't matter whether you're a apparel or shoe or outdoor store, your inventory uh, rotation is tied directly to your customer visitation. The average boutique in North America sees their customers on the average of four to five times a year. This is a shocking thing that actually was in the New York Times a year ago. Zara, the, the, average, cust the average good customer of Zara comes in 17 times a year. Why? Well, it's fast fashion, has a short shelf life, every six weeks a brand new inventory. But one other thing also that Zara does that I think is unique. The idea of scarcity is a powerful driver of, of sales. And Zara understands that because if they have a jacket that, that are shipped into the stores the first week around the globe and they, and they experience something like an 80% sell through on that jacket in re, week one, it's a winner. Almost every other retailer would jump on that jacket and either make more if they're vertical like Zara or reorder it if they could. Let's get more of it in. Zara does not do that. They will not remake an askew because they want their customers to know that if you like that jacket and if you decide you want to think about it overnight and you'll come back tomorrow, because of the fast rotation and how quickly they replace inventory, there is a very good chance if you come back tomorrow or the next day, that jacket will be gone and more importantly, never to be seen again. Now, <clears throat> Allbirds began selling shoes online in 2016. And in 2017, May of 2017, they opened their first uh, flagship retail store in San Francisco. Now, opening retail stores wasn't just a way for Allbirds to increase its physical footprint. It gave the company a way to interact with their customers directly that they could not do online. And they provide the kind of shopping experience that, quite frankly, very few other footwear retailers can offer. Now, the stores themselves are as minimalistic as Allbirds footwear. And select pairs are wall-mounted uh, 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 in their stores. And they showcase the company's newest designs without overwhelming the consumer. Remember, if you really want to shut down your consumer's uh, 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 um, uh, senses, just use clutter. It's the worst thing you can do. The shop floors are as are similarly roomy, and they allow they allow the customer to really browse at their leisure easily. It also gives their sales associates the opportunity to answer their questions, tell people about the products, the values that as they shop. Their New York location even features a service bar where customers can take their time finding the right size. But what the result is is a relaxing educational experience that goes beyond the clinical nature of most shoe stores. The customers, the, the company's retail locations have, have proved so popular that in 2021, the plans are to open 20 new locations, most of which will be in the United States. But footwear is one of the most lucrative and competitive verticals in retail. And in a multi-billion dollar industry dominated by entrenched incumbents, new entrants like all birds are very uncommon, which makes what they're doing and their success all the more remarkable. You know, Showfields in New York has been called the most interesting store in the world. And it is the latest example of what we call the new retail movement. Now, sometimes it's referred to as C-commerce, which is collaborative commerce, and it seeks to redefine physical retail. Now, Showfields is as much a mall as it is a department store with tenants within their walls. These tenants occupy pop-up spaces and they occupy them for about every four to six months, and then a new tenant comes in. So it's always changing. And each floor within Showfields is designed to really kind of flow seamlessly from one brand to the next. 
And it's also interspersed with art collections from local artists to community spaces. Um, the result is, I think, a uniquely contemporary take on the idea of traditional department stores. Because the idea of the traditional department stores is from a time that's long gone. And this idea that Showfields is spearheading, I think is something that can and will gain traction elsewhere in the coming years. Now, I think we've all heard of Sun Tzu and his book, The Art of War, the Chinese philosopher in general. Know thy enemy, know thyself, know thy enemy, a thousand battles, a thousand victories. Now, actually, people think of that, most people have never read The Art of War. The Art of War uh, is not this huge tome that you have to hunker down for months at a time to read, right? It's, it's 25 pages long. It's a very brief work. And Sun Tzu has really, really good thoughts that can be used for retail. For example, know thyself, know thy enemy. Know thy enemy. Now, Sam Walton is a great example of know thy enemy. Because Sam Walton, when he started Walmart, was obsessed with his competitors. In fact, in the early years of Walmart, it was an absolute obsession. Now, Sears and Kmart didn't have an obsession with Sam Walton and Walmart then, but Sam Walton spent his first years in business being in a Kmart store three days a week. Very few people know that. For years, he would spend days at a time in Kmart stores, learning what they did well and learning what they didn't do that well. He was obsessed with his competitor. Kmart was not obsessed with Walmart until it was too late. Now, know thyself, know thy enemy. Well, so let's go back to Socrates for a second. Because Socrates was right. Socrates is known as saying, we don't know what we don't know. That's a more common phrase in today's world, but very few people don't know where that came from. So the story of this was that there was a man named Sharafan, and I have no idea if I'm pronouncing it correctly, and it really doesn't matter because you'll probably never hear this story again. But Sharafan asked the Oracle of Delphi if there was no man wiser than his friend Socrates. The priestess pondered that and answered, there is no man wiser than Socrates. Now, when told this, Socrates couldn't believe this. I know that I have no wisdom, small or great. But he, to check that out, he decided to travel the land searching for all those he thought wiser. And one by one, he met them. And with that, each one was a disappointment because Socrates began to see the wisdom of the oracle's remark. Be unlike Socrates, all these other men thought they knew everything. And Socrates alone knew that he didn't know what he didn't know. Let me put it in other words. Knowing he wasn't wise actually made him the wisest of all men. Now, you don't have to be a philosophy major to appreciate the meaning behind this story. In fact, it applies to all fields. It applies to all human endeavor, including retailing. What I only know what I know, and I, and I don't know what I don't know. Am I efficiently rotating my inventory in and out of the store? Do I have too much right now? Do I have too little? Am I drilling down and finding the problems and finding the opportunities? How am I tracking this? What are my sales patterns show? Are sales trending up or down by category? And what does that trend mean? Are, if I've got more than one store, is my inventory correctly balanced? Should I adjust my forecast because the inventory is too high, too low? How about my on order? Do I have enough coming in? Does it fit the right amount? Were my sales profitable? Was there enough inventory to produce those sales? How fresh is my inventory? Do I need to take some markdowns? Is my turnover appropriate? I could go on and on and on. Do we know this? 
Because one of the most important things to understand is that there are diamonds in your data. A pickaxe to unearthing diamonds in real life is, is as data is to unearthing opportunities in your business. But you need to know where to look. You need to know where to drill down, where we find these opportunities, because they exist in every retailer's database. We just have to find them. Those diamonds can be something like in a subcategory where we simply start, we, sh we need to drill down in terms of our inventory. If we carry jeans, that's fine. We know how many jeans we sold last month. We know how much our inventory is, but then let's drill down and what's underneath. This could be by vendor. This could be any way that you wanna look at your inventory. In this case, an example is basic jeans and fashion jeans, very simple. Last month, we sold exactly the same. We sold $12,000 in basic jeans. We sold 11,500 in fashion. But sales only tell us a part of the story. We need to look at profitability, yes, of course, but we also need to look at our investment in inventory. But you see here in our, in our basic jeans, we have a 28, almost $29,000 inventory, somewhat sufficient to do 12,000 in sales. But fashion jeans, I just found diamonds in my backyard because we do not have enough inventory we're selling through so fast that we're missing business. There is an opportunity there that data can help us find. It can be things like in, if you carry in a women's store, fashion hats and winter hats. If you look at the trend in fashion hats right now, we're trending this month to sell $5,400 in fashion hats. Our inventory is 6,000. Do you think there's a high degree of likelihood that we won't make that trend because we're gonna start running out? Meanwhile, winter hats, we're trending to do 3,400, but we have twice as many winter hats in stock. We have skirts and jeans and bottoms. Well, the, 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 the business right now, as of last night, we're doing about the same business in jeans as skirts. But look at the inventory. We've got, we have less inventory in skirts than we've sold throughout through this part of the month, last few weeks. Well, jeans, we sit with 11,000. Do you think we're going to sell more skirts if we had more skirts? Do you think we're going to miss business unless we bring in more skirts? These are the diamonds in your backyard. This is what we need to look at to drill down. William Ockham is uh, a philosopher, an English philosopher, and uh, one of his great quotes were, entities should not be multiplied unnecessarily, okay. Well, that's also known as Occam's razor. And Rock, Occam's razor is probably you've heard of. Occam's razor actually can be boiled down to that the simplest explanation is usually the right one. The essence of Occam's razor is to shave away those things that are not necessary. The goal is to pare down solutions to the simplest form that add the greatest value. Large retail chains operating hundreds of stores like Walmart have essentially been using Occam's razor to pare down and streamline operations, distribution, inventory, logistics, all adding value to their bottom line by reducing costs and, and increasing their ROI. So what's the problem? What's changed? What's changed is that in a post-pandemic world, there is a massive paradigm shift from historical retail centricity to consumer centricity. In the new post-pandemic normal of Omnichannel, for example, consumers are the ones that now determine value based on their preferences of how they shop, how they choose to purchase. In the context of Occam's razor, it is today's consumer that is paring away the complexity, defining simplicity from their perspective, not the retailers. So this is true in metrics. We all know metrics are your scorecard. Just as a pilot will use his instruments to get from point A to point B, so you must trust your metrics to get you from point A to point B. Metrics are important for a number of reasons. They help you become more profitable. 
They help you bring in more sales to control costs. They're levers on your business. You pull one, several parts of your business react. It is, retail is a blend of art and science. It is the science part of it. And while retail continues to evolve and adapt to a changing consumer preference and new technologies, it is increasingly critical to develop newer, more relevant metrics to accurately value and measure retail performance. Because quite frankly, the current, much of the current suite of metrics that we have been using were built for a time that no longer exists. What do I mean by that? We have a 12 week cash flow. Everything we need to be looking at in our business is now condensed the window of focus. Obviously 12 months or even six months out carries too much uncertainty today in an uncertain retail environment. But if we start looking at things from a 12 week perspective, that allows maximum agility. Now we actually give this tool away for free if you go on our website at managementone.com, 12 week cash flow tool, which is an excellent way to estimate your cash flow for the next three months, the next 12 weeks. How much cash in am I gonna take? How much cash out do I need? Where am I gonna be at the end of three months or at the end of two months or the end of one month? This simple template is condensing our business into shorter time segments which is what we need to do in a post-pandemic world. We know how much inventory we have. That's a very simple metric in a pre-pandemic world. In a post-pandemic world, it's not enough to know how much you have, but it's more important to know how much is current because that's the true value of your inventory and the consumer wants to shop new. So we know how much we have by category, but how much of that is current and relative to really doing business. We can look at that type of thing in many ways in data. For example, I just want to share with you jewelry in this, this particular retailer, where in the accessory business, they're sitting 33% of their accessory inventory is sitting with jewelry, if you see right there. Yet sales in jewelry are only 22%. So that is not matched up very well at all. But here's the more important part. How much of your inventory is fresh? 33% of our inventory and accessories is in jewelry. Well, 22% is in sales, but only 18% is new inventory. You think they're gonna have a problem if they don't solve this problem? It's not how much inventory you have, it's how much new inventory is just flowed in. And speaking of that, maybe one of the most misleading metrics of old retail, it's an accounting metric, is cost of goods sold. Why is cost of goods sold, which literally calculates your gross profit in your store at the end of the year, the most misleading metric in retail? And, and, and the reason for that is that cost of goods sold is what it says it is. It is the cost of the goods you sold. Let me give you an example. I bought 50 widgets. They arrived in my store, and five months later, I sold five. We'll say with the number five on this. So I bought 50. They came in. Five months later, I sold a total of five, all at full price. Excellent margin. So my cost of goods sold would be terrific. But I had to pay for 50. So my cost of goods purchased, not so terrific. We need to start looking at cash flow measurements more than ever. 20,000 doors closed in the last 12 months. That was through a combination of chapter seven, complete liquidation of retailers to chapter 11, a reorganization to get out of leases to close doors. And what did those retailers all have in common? I asked that question to retailers and they tell me they're in malls or their department stores and you know they were high-end goods, they were dressy apparel, yes and no. Because there, the reality is they had one thing in common they all shared. They were all overly leveraged. They all had too much debt. Too much debt through a combination of poor inventory management and maybe leveraged buyouts from private equity firms years earlier, which were stripping them of their assets. Now, these cash flow measurements I'm talking about, 
are more important than ever because if the vulnerability is debt, then the, the antidote, the vaccine, is better cash flow. You know, you can run your store for months, and many of us do, without showing a profit on the bottom line. But we cannot run our store for one day without cash flow. So instead of looking at gross margin dollars, which can be expressed over a rolling 12 months, as you see, we should be looking at cash margin dollars. What is our cash flow? Gross margin dollars represents profit still sitting on racks or on your walls or uh, in boxes and not in your checkbook. Cash margin dollars is what's in your checkbook. We have reports like this at, at, at Management One that we think are absolutely critical. For example, here's a retailer that for the last 12 months in this particular category had a cost of purchases of 39%. That's excellent for the entire year. That's maybe where they wanted to be. In other words, if they sold $60,000 in sales, their probably purchases were only $24,000, about 40%. Excellent cash flow. Meanwhile, this retailer in this category had a very high cost of purchase, which is getting higher, by the way. The last 12 months, it's 58%. The last six months, it's 60. And the last three months, it's gone to 67. They are buying more and more and more merchandise, and more and more of the merchandise is still sitting without being sold. Inventory health is about return on investment. Gross margin return on investment was a key metric pre-pandemic. Post-pandemic, it's how much cash you produce out of that inventory or cash margin return on investment, not paper profit based on return on investment. We have reports like this in, at, at Management One because of the importance we put on it. If accessories has a CMROI of $4.13, but a GMROI of $5.12, what does that mean? That means that in the accessory business, you are building inventories faster than you're selling them. And so your profit against your investment on paper is much higher than your cash. Look, part of this on inventory health in a post-pandemic world has more to do with your balance sheet than your income statement. Why do I say that? Because the balance sheet measures assets and liabilities. How much debt do you have? How much inventory that's gone unsold do you have? The balance sheet has become more and more important in measuring your success and the health, the health of your inventory than the income statement in a post-pandemic world. And in a post-pandemic world, because change is happening so quickly, information has to be now, real time. And there's rules for real-time information. Can I make a decision on it? Is it measurable? Do I determine metrics on a dashboard that, that identify these changes? And how often do I look at this daily, weekly? Am I going to use data to make decisions or am I just going to wing it in a pre-pandemic world? Because right now, I think a lot of the great retailers are now trending and they're hustling. What's performing? Where are we trending? They're looking at reports, knowing that in athletic shoes, in the shoe store, female athletic shoes, we're doing pretty, the forecast 32, we're going to, we're, we're right at that. We're at, we're trending to do 30. Meanwhile, the sandals, we're, we, we're, the, our forecast was 16, we're trending to do eight. Not so well as of last night. Mark Twain, a little more modern philosopher than Occam and Socrates. Mark Twain, whenever you find yourself on the side of the majority, this is so Mark Twain, it's time to pause and reflect. So what does that mean to retail? Well, I wanna start with markdowns because we look at markdowns a little bit differently than maybe other people do. Markdowns are a tool to generate inventory health. They're a very good thing. And there's some misconceptions about markdowns that the majority may think are true, but are not. The first misconception, markdowns are not a zero sum game. That's misconception number one. And I think initiated with my good friends who are accountants. 
because from an accounting point of view, you shouldn't take markdowns because they destroy profitability. They increase your cost of goods sold. And so you should be very, very careful in taking them because they are a, um, a burden, if you will, on your profits. Well, that is true if markdowns were a zero sum game. Let me explain what I mean. If your shelves were full of merchandise that wasn't selling and you had to generate cash flow to get it out, so you took markdowns to sell all of it, and then you never replaced it with anything new, well, that would be a zero sum game. You lost a lot of money. But the fact is, is that they really only hurt profitability if we don't refill the shelves, which we do. The shelves are immediately refilled, a merchandise that will hopefully sell better, and those profitable sales mitigate the effects of the markdowns that you took on the merchandise that wasn't selling. It is not a zero sum game. Fallacy number two or misconception number two, Paul, don't take markdowns because if you do, you'll train the customers to only buy on sale. That is true if you are timid on markdowns. Post-pandemic retail is about cash flow, not paper profits. And so if it's cash flow you're looking for, you're talking about taking a markdown that's going to work as the first markdown. You're talking about finding the price that you know will move it within a week or two. Instead of putting it around the edges and going, I just want to milk out a little more margin on these things that aren't selling. That has to end because if you take an aggressive markdown to get the money back quickly, first of all, you won't have a store full of markdown merchandise. They'll be gone immediately. Most of your customer won't, customers won't even know it was there. And you get the money back to replace it with something that'll sell better. Again, back to it's not a zero-sum game. When you find yourself on the majority, maybe rethink everything. It's time to pause and reflect. There are retailers now that when they that never thought they would be on the majority, that they're going to do things different. Our client Paxton Home in Lexington, Kentucky, is a fabulous example of this. It's a mother-daughter duo, Amy Mellinger and Paige Pugh. Amy was a super successful realtor in Lexington, Kentucky, and her daughter Paige has a master's degree at Duke University in marketing. Neither one is a retail background. And they are shaking up furniture and home decor retail in Lexington, Kentucky by doing something that I've, we've never heard other retailers do. They have a store that's not in a retail area, but in a warehouse section of Lexington. And they have decided that they're going to be open one weekend a month. That's nine hours a month. That's it. Zara used scarcity on product. Paxton Home used scarcity on just your ability to go buy there. You're only going to be open for two days a month. You, I have to go. And every Saturday, that Saturday morning each month, they, they look at a long line of cars waiting to get into the parking lot before they open. And the line to get in the store stretches around the block. They literally, if you go on their website, they tell their customers, don't necessarily come in when we first open because to avoid the lines, come later in the afternoon. Each piece of furniture is handpicked by Amy and Paige and they turn their inventory back to scarcity again. So every month when those customers come in, they are opening, they are looking at tons and tons of new items that weren't there last month. Now I love London, I go to London often, um, and Boots, if you go to London, no, it's a, uh, it's sort of the, sort of the Walgreens sort of, of the UK. Um, you know, they call themselves a health and beauty retailer, but they have decided, by the way, Boots has been around for 170 years. It's so European. Um, so they've launched a concept store in Covent Garden in London. And this new space is the biggest makeover they've ever had in the history of their company. You know, it's a marble tiled beauty and it's home to like 300 brands. And it has its own YouTube studio an Instagram area for the kids. So shoppers can film or take pictures with their new purchases. Again, it's more than just buying. It's fun. It's shopping. It's interactive. They've tapped into the sustain, uh, sustainability trend, and they've installed um, their first ever water tap on filtered water where consumers can come in. If they've got a water bottle with them, they can fill it up free of charge. They uh, can go to a shampoo refill station. Uh, uh, they can they ditch the plastic carrier bags for, for an hour better environment, uh, uh, brown paper bags. 
They want to learn. They want to, they want to learn what do people like and love about the store so that this can be a blueprint in a post-pandemic world for the future boot stores throughout the UK. Now, Heyday is a client of ours in Bozeman, Montana, and they definitely know that whenever you find yourself on the side of the majority, it's time to pause and reflect. Heyday is a lifestyle boutique located in the heart of beautiful downtown Bozeman, and it offers a fresh approach to everyday celebrations, gift giving, and giving back to the community. And the amount of growth that the owners of Heyday have experienced just in eight years would make your mind spin from a few hundred thousand dollars in sales to multi, multi, multi millions of dollars. How do they do it? Well, they believe in giving. It's Heyday giving, it's their commitment. The team at Heyday believes in the importance of supporting local nonprofit sectors. And they, st they strive to improve the quality of life for the greater Bozeman community. And they are involved in every kind of charity and giving from education to animals, to the environment, to youth and poverty and veterans, just to name a few. People, the consumer likes this. It's a win-win. And they, and they have responded to what Heyday does. In March was, was International Women's Month. I had no idea, but Heyday did. So the entire month of March in their store was, 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 was dedicated to International Women's Month. When they started dreaming up this the celebration, there was no shortage of ideas of their sales force. The local community is in Bozeman full of strong, powerful, brilliant, incredible women. And they began to focus in on women who made an impact during this past challenging year of the pandemic, who continually provided a community when so many had lost that sense. It was a mission to empower women. And so they created a whole pop-up shop within the store around the hashtag, girl, get after it. And I can tell you the entire month, it was so successful. They shop, you, they, they go in and shop the collection, the special collection for just that month in store and online. And when that merchandise was gone, it was gone. Dr. Benjamin Spock isn't even known as a philosopher, but he does say some interesting things. And I love this quote from him. He says, trust yourself because you know more than you think. And I think that's true of a lot of retailers. I think that's a lot of retailers that are on this presentation because you all have these, I think these traits Empathy, patience, friendliness, multitasking, being willing to learn, a desire to help others. These are all traits that great retailers share. And you should trust yourself because you, you know more than you think. The first thing we need to understand, as I mentioned earlier, is that in a post-pandemic world, the consumer is going to crave emotional connections. We've been tied up in our house for 14 months. We need to get out. So do customers like shopping in your store? You know, anyone can buy what you sell, actually. But how do you know they're going to come back and buy from you again? And what is it that brings them back to your store? I think these are important questions in understanding why your customers buy from you and not your competitors. Do they like doing business with you? That's an important factor. We, should, we, we need to organize our sales strategy and how our products, how our services, even everyday interactions make our customers feel. Because emotion is a major driver for purchases. And it's even a bigger driver when it comes to loyalty. I talk about share of heart. We need to be thinking more about share of heart than just necessarily market share. So tell your customer who you are on your website, in the store, meet your team. People like to buy from people. They don't like buying from large, faceless, monolithic corporations. They will buy local, if you, but tell them who you are. This is all part of the storytelling that I believe is so very, very important. We like to connect. And 
when they read a story, it activates oxytocin, which is a chemical which powers trust and empathy in their brain. We love to, he to read stories because we were read stories when we were little. And, and, and when it comes to stories, eight hour day on their website is unbelievable because they had me at hello. Well, that's exactly about how their about us section of eight hour day starts. It is a welcoming greeting. And for that reason, it made me browse more. Why? Because as much as I may love good design, inspiring selection of clothing or shoes, the consumer wants to meet the people that curate all, curate all that content, all those products. And furthermore, it's equally rewarding when you realize that they're just as eager to meet you. Start a visual and verbal dialogue with you. Nathan Strandberg and Katie Kurt are doing what makes them happy, and this is obvious throughout their page, throughout their business. It's infectious. So when they come back to the store, welcome them back. We've all gone through a tough time. Acknowledge it. There's a store in DC that says that they love you. I don't know if you wanna go that far, but tell them you care. And new merchandise means new stories. Remember Zara, customer visitations linked directly to inventory turns. When you get new product in, be creative, tell them about the product. Don't just put it out on racks. Because we love new, promote novelty. You know that being exposed to something new and novel increases how much dopamine, which is similar to oxytocin, it's a chemical in our brain. Why do customers sit outside an Apple store before they come out with a new product that's essentially the same as the old product? Because when we see something new, we see it as a potential to reward us in some way. Promote the novelty of your store in the new. And have fun. Grab your customer's attention. You know what? Shoes are boring. Wear sneakers. Now, I think Ski Rack does this as good as anything. It's a client of ours in Burlington, Vermont, and they celebrated their first uh, 50 years, their first 50 years in business, um, uh, just before the pandemic hit. And I think in this video that I'm going to share with you, it covers much of what I'm talking about going forward post-pandemic. What is it? It's fun. They're going to tell you about their history. They're going to tell you that they're local. They feature their employees. The consumer is drawn to connections that they will not find online. It's how the store makes them feel. And it is very, very creative. Hey you, in case you haven't heard, Ski Rack's been around for 50 years. That's half a century. Let me give you some context. 1969, Nixon was president. Armstrong took man's first step on the moon and Woodstock rocked the world. But who cares about all that? In Burlington, Vermont, something bigger was brewing. Twin brothers Zandy and John Wheeler, along with a group of UVM ski bums, opened up a small town ski shop and called it Ski Rack. They set up shop on 15 Center Street, only to expand in 74 to a new space on Main, where our bike floor currently lies. 50 years has seen a lot of changes in gear. You guys remember leather boots and straight skis? What about the day level days? Over the years, we've narrowed down our gear to the best of the best to give you the greatest experience possible. In 2002, we discovered the internet when our service manager changed careers. Dampening is gonna be a game changer next year. Now he's our chief tech wizard. Thanks, Richard. Well, we love to serve our online community. The system here in the store depends on real knowledge, real people, and a real passion for getting you outdoors. Now that's real. You want more real? Come with me. I'm talking cramp-ending, comfort-loving, custom, boot-fit precision. Boom! We got you. I'm talking blister-killing, injury-preventing, run-shoe-fit perfection. Boom! We got you. I'm talking behind the store, downtown Burlington. Easy, free parking. Boom, we got you. Oh yeah, I almost forgot. You know what else the internet won't do? Straighten your derailleur hanger from when you went OTB last weekend. 
fix a core shot on your skis from that epic pow day. Or even give you hands-on advice on how to not need our help in the first place. Isn't that right, Nick? <laughs> uh, in 2019, we have three stores, still locally owned, with an ever-growing family of outdoor enthusiasts. <laughs> Bottom line, we want our community to get outside and to celebrate 50 years. We pledge to continue to support local efforts to help preserve where we play so there's plenty of it left for generations to come. Now you know our story. We're ready for the next 50 years. We'll leave the rest to you. Dan, I think we're done. I think it's time to clean it up now, don't you think? Mm -hmm. So a wise man once said, never let a good crisis go to waste. And um, this may prove so important right now because of this, what I believe is a once in a lifetime opportunity for independent retailers to really transform their businesses, your businesses, and rewrite the rules of the retail playbook. You know, the pandemic has supercharged society's shop local mindset and has highlighted the critical importance of small businesses within our economic makeup. There is still a primacy to shopping brick and mortar that can't be entirely replaced by a website because your stores evoke those experiences and those sensations that a website can't. So use your data. Start making sound financial merchandising systems based on cash flow rather than just simply paper profits. Zig when others zag. Be proud of your roots. Tell your story. Build consumer loyalty through share of heart, not just share of market. Give back to the community. Show them the care. And if this is the road you follow, then maybe, just maybe, COVID-19 might prove to have been a silver lining playbook that taught us all how to be better at this game we call retail. So I wanna thank all my friends at Celeron for this invitation to speak at the 2021 virtual conference. Um, I would invite everybody to come to our virtual room, uh, the Management One virtual room, and we could chat about your business. Um, I'll be there with Nico Cabral and a bunch of other very smart Management One representatives. And I look forward to seeing everyone next year in person at the Celerant Conference 2022. Thank you, everybody.